Suppose you have a function whose value at 0 equals negative 1 and whose value at 1 equals 1. That is, it goes from negative to positive. And suppose this function is continuous. Does this function have an x-intercept? Well, you might be wondering, well, isn't it obvious it's right there? And you are right. But it turns out that this particular function does not have a formula for this x-intercept. Using this same idea, we can try to approximate this particular x-intercept, or at least the first few decimal values for the x-intercept. Consider the function values at 0 and at 1 respectively, and compute the function value at the midpoint. In this case, the function value is negative, because it lies below the x-axis, and therefore we can shrink the search space so that the blue line is our new left bound. But if we can do something once, we could do it a second time, and obtain a negative value once again, Therefore, we will push in the left bound yet again. This time, when we calculate the midpoint, the function value is positive. So instead of moving the left bound, we're going to push in the right bound. We can keep doing this and the search space gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And ideally, this point converges to the root that we are interested in finding. As we close in, the approximation of this root gets finer and finer. And this does converge to the desired root. This is made possible via the Intermediate Value Theorem, and this root-finding algorithm is known as the bisection method because we are bisecting the search space in each iteration. For a proof of why the bisection method works, check out the document in the description box below. Other root-finding methods include the newton raphson method, which uses derivatives to calculate the intercepts. And there are several algorithms known as fixed-point iterations as well. For instance, show that there is a real number c, such that the cosine of c turns out to equal c itself. Try this problem out for yourself first, and unpause for the solution. This problem equivalently wants us to find a real number c such that c minus the cosine of c equals 0. In other words, c is the root of a function, which motivates us to define the function f of x equals to x minus the cosine of x. We want to show that this function has a root. If we substitute x equals to 0, we will get 0 minus the cosine of 0, which equals 0 minus 1 this number is negative. We can draw the graph and plot the point as follows. Plugging in x equals to 1 gives us 1 minus the cosine of 1, which is strictly greater than 1 minus 1, making it positive. We can plot f of 1 on the graph as follows. But since x and cosine of x are both continuous, that means you can draw the graph without lifting up your pen, the picture clearly shows us that it must have an x-intercept. More rigorously, we say that by the intermediate value theorem, there exists a real number c with the property that f of c equals 0. But unpacking the meaning of f of c, we get that c minus the cosine of c equals 0. And by some algebra, this means that the cosine of c really does equal c. More generally, this is an example of a fixed-point theorem. The Banach fixed-point theorem, common in real analysis, can be generalized to the Brouwer fixed-point theorem in topology, and further generalized to the Katukani fixed-point theorem used in game theory, which the mathematician John Nash used to prove the existence of Nash equilibria. So far, we have been looking at the intermediate value theorem in terms of the existence of roots, but this idea generalizes very easily for any value that lies between f of 0 and f of 1. If the function is continuous, it must intersect the line y equals to m at least once. More formally, there exists some real number c such that f of c equals m. Furthermore, this is true as long as m lies in between f of 0 and f of 1. For the details on how to prove this using the simpler intermediate value theorem, 
check out the document in the description box below. The Intermediate Value Theorem can be used to prove several results in mathematics. Here's a fun little theoretical puzzle for you. Suppose you have f of 0 being smaller than f of 1, suppose the function f is continuous, and suppose different inputs to the function give different outputs. Finally, suppose you have two numbers x1 and x2, where x1 is smaller than x2. Can you prove that small inputs when plugged into the function give small outputs? Pause the video if you'd like to try it for yourself, and when you're ready, unpause for the solution. When plugging in the inputs, the outputs could either be smaller, equal, or larger. If the outputs are equal to each other, since x1 is smaller than x2, the inputs are different. By our assumption, the outputs ought to be different as well. However, under our supposed condition, the outputs turn out to be the same. So we have a result saying that the outputs are same and not the same at the same time. This is clearly impossible, which allows us to rule out the case when the outputs are the same. We want to show that smaller inputs give smaller outputs. But after some thought, it might not be the easiest task to do. Instead, we're going to try to eliminate the situation when smaller inputs give larger outputs. Let's first sketch the situation where f of 0 is smaller than f of 1. And while the general problem might be a little bit too challenging to deal with, let's work with this special case when the smaller input is 0 and the larger input is 1 half. Since the function is continuous, we must join up the dots without lifting up our pen. Of course, this representation isn't the most accurate. After all, a function can have very erratic and wild behavior even if it is continuous. But drawing the straight lines gives us enough intuition to solve our problem. In particular, we notice that the red dot is slightly higher than the yellow dot and slightly lower than the green dot. By the intermediate value theorem, there is a real number between a half and a one whose function value equals the red dot. This means we have two different inputs creating the same output, which is once again impossible. What's even more fascinating is that this argument works for any number between 0 and 1. It's not just a half, it could be for any real number t in between 0 and 1 we will always have two different inputs giving the same output, which is an impossible situation. Now consider the alternate situation when the smaller input is a half and the larger input is one. The yellow dot will lie above the green dot. By the intermediate value theorem again, we can always find a number between zero and a half such that the output equals f of one. In other words, we can once again obtain two different inputs that give us the same output, which is impossible. And yet again, this works for any input value t, not just a half. No matter what the input value is, we are always going to get two different inputs that give us the same blue output. These two results tell us that our function must lie in between f of 0 and f of 1. Now let's try to prove the general result by considering the smaller input one-third and the larger input two-thirds, and suppose that the smaller input gives the larger output. We can once again connect up the dots since the function is continuous, and since the output f of one-third lies in between the green dots, by the intermediate value theorem yet again, we can find a different input that gives the same output. This is once again impossible. But this argument isn't unique to one third and two thirds. This will work for any x1 being smaller than x2. As long as x1 and x2 are between 0 and 1, we will always have two different inputs that give the same output, which is impossible. This means we not only ruled out a case when the outputs are the same, but we also ruled out the case when the smaller input gives the larger output. This leaves us with one and only one possible conclusion, that is, the smaller input 
gives us the smaller output. For the formal proof, you can check out the document in the description box below. Just like how useful the intermediate value theorem is for calculus, the squeeze theorem is also a really useful theorem in computing limits. If you want to prove three limits using one squeeze theorem, click on the video here.